Today we're looking at the role of choice. And let me just, uh, before I start commenting, let me just uh, share this scripture and explain how I want to use it. The kingdom of heaven is like a net which was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into vessels and threw away the bad. As you know, I've used this passage many times talking about choice uh, the whole concept of choice and choices that we make we're all making choices every moment and the choices that we make set the standard for our life or it would be, be probably be better to say that we set the standard and make choices based on that to understand that and I've used this passage in a way of you know, how were these fishermen deciding what was a good fish and what was a bad? If they jumped in their boats and went out fishing and they were doing it on behalf of a, a pet store, for example, which I don't think they were back then, but if they were today, there would be a certain kind of fish they would consider good. And they would probably throw away a trout or a salmon because if you've ever tried to put a trout in an aquarium, a small aquarium as I did one time, uh, they're out in like two seconds. They just shoot out like a bullet. <clears throat> so they're not good, uh, warm, fuzzy, hugging type fish. You know, they're, they're not aquarium fish. But if they were fishing for a restaurant, that would be a prime target. Tilapia, trout, salmon, uh, anything. So. They set the standard and they decide what is a good fish and what is a bad fish. In reality, there's no such thing as a good and bad fish. Uh, that's all our judgment. But the point that is being made here is that standard, a standard is set and we make choices based on that standard. And that's kind of what we're seeing with this whole pandemic thing is we all individually have set standards, uh, a certain kind of standard, and we, we deal uh, with issues that come up based on that standard, the way we think of it or whatever. What we have to think about in terms of our quality of life is the choice of fish I'm keeping making my life better or is it making my, my life worse? If I'm saying I just can't go along, you know, when, when uh, I think it was Peter that brought Jesus uh, the tax coin and said, do we pay this to Caesar? He said, render unto Caesar. What is Caesar's and unto God? What is God's? Why would he say that? He was doing the same thing as he's talking about in this parable. How well do you want to get along with your government? How much peace of mind? How much peace do you want? Do you want your doors kicked in because you weren't paying your taxes? That's what he's saying. You know, we have two sides to us, two levels here. So that's one, one side of the whole choice making issue. And the question is, how far does that go? Do we choose when we leave this planet? Do we choose when we come to this planet? Is it that far? Do we choose our families? Do we choose our parents? And there's uh, 
the belief that we do, that we make choices like that. And so that's what I want to discuss today. And you may not think it's real practical, but I think you will by the time I'm done, why I'm talking about this in this way. Because I know people that, in, in, which is very easy to do, I understand this, that we can hang on to resentments because we, we think we're bound to people, either by family or by uh, whatever, uh, whatever virtue that may be. But I've often used this passage, as I just said, to illustrate the role of choice, especially as it pertains uh, to attitudes and experiences we encounter in life. Did I choose to incarnate at this time? And did I choose the members of my family? How many think that you chose your family? Just a couple. How many think it's a possibility that choice goes that far? See, I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to stand up here and say I know the answer to that, because I don't. I have no recollection of that. But my logic would say, did I, was I forced to enter this body at this time? Did somebody make me or something make me do that? And as I think of life overall, my experience here now, has anybody ever made me do something? You know, nobody's making me wear a mask this morning. I can choose not to. I'm not doing it now because I'm exempted. But I will do it as I mingle with everybody. I don't have to, but I'm going to do that because I can do it. It's okay. I'll, I'll live with it. I don't agree with it necessarily, but I don't disagree with it because I know so many do agree with it, and I want to be as cordial to everybody here as I possibly can. And I don't want to get into a political battle. This church is, should be a refuge from all of that. It's not always, but it should be. So some of us believe that's a possibility, and I don't know if it happens or not. All I'm saying is, if we were not given a choice, if it was not our choice, then whose choice was it? Was it an accident? As Lulu on Hee Haw used to say, that 95% of all humans are caused by accidents. So did we, do we have choice everywhere else but the important places? If you read some of the near-death research uh, that's out there, you'll find that people uh, often, or not necessarily near-death research, but just research around the process of dying, that people will often wait until they see some important event in their life before they pass on, before they let go. That's a very common occurrence. So there's some choice there, apparently, some level of choice. And is it not possible that it happens on the other side as well, you know, as, um, in terms of birth? How many of you believe your parents gave birth to your body? <laughs> I think that's how we got here. Actually, they didn't give birth to the body you have now. I think that one lasted about 11 months or something, and then you got a new one. But we all understand the, the idea. How many of you believe your parents gave birth to your soul? So where'd that come from? And did the soul have a choice as to when it stepped into this planet? Uh, reading some of the reincarnation material uh, where children recall past lives, some of them very definitely made the decision to be born into certain families. It's pretty amazing. And it's hard to, when you read the, the, the stories, and uh, Ian Stevenson was the one that wrote a lot about this for, at the University of Virginia. But he would go back and interview families and make the connections, you know, do the, uh, do the legwork 
and make the connections. It's when you read his material, it's very hard to deny the uh, reality of reincarnation. But if you didn't choose to step into this body, then somebody chose it for you, or something chose it for you, or are you an accident? And I'm not saying any of this really makes that much difference, because it happened. We know it happened. But it makes a difference if you're hanging on to something that you've been carrying for a long time. So consider this example. Let's say you want to travel to a place, let's say Earth. But let's say, in the example, we're going to fly someplace. Does this mean you also choose that obnoxious passenger seated next to you? The consciousness purist, purist will say, we attract the people and circumstances from which our soul can learn the most. There are no accidents. So how many of you believe that if you did choose your family, you chose them to learn some lesson you needed? And you don't have to raise your hand, I'm just throwing this out. See, I, that's what I was kind of taught to believe when I first got into unity. There's a pretty strong uh, community of people that say, yes, you chose your parents. It's almost said as if that's a, an absolute fact. Well, nobody knows that. If I had a, a memory of that, I could stand up here with authority and say, yes, we do, if I remembered, but I don't. So I, I can only speculate. But when you get on the plane, you do make choices. Maybe you choose your airline. Maybe the airlines are parents. But we definitely don't choose the passengers. If we did, I would ask for resumes. <laughs> because I have been seated by some people that if it were legal to carry a firearm, <laughs> well, maybe not. I've been seated by some very obnoxious people. I was seated by a woman one time that um, talked nonstop. And fortunately, the, when the pressure in the plane began to change, I literally went deaf. I could not hear a word she said, but I could see her lips moving, and they never stopped. So all I had to do was, I was trying to yawn and trying to chew gum and you know, try to get my hearing back, but it didn't come back for three days. I've never had anything like that happen. So God must have been involved in that situation. <clears throat> but I would just nod occasionally as if I was following her. But I wouldn't choose to sit by a person who annoyed me for the two hours on the airplane. And I guess that's getting worse. You know, people used to do things like wear ties on planes and dress up, you know, when, when we'd fly. When I first started flying years, years ago, that's kind of how it was. But it's not that way now, and there's no telling, you know, what you're going to get into. But you make the choice to fly to maybe even, maybe you choose the airline even. But the airline chooses the passengers, and that's all totally random. So maybe that's what it's like when we're born into a family. That maybe we choose our parents, or maybe we choose a certain time that appeals to us for whatever reason. But we don't choose the passengers that we fly with. And I can uh, live with that idea, and I'm just throwing it out there. So you can spend your life thinking a difficult person has something to teach you. But if you can't grasp what you're supposed to learn, there's a good chance you'll carry the burden of believing your soul isn't evolved enough, and you'll probably keep attracting similar personalities until you finally get it. In other words, if you grow up in a difficult family situation, and you're trying to remember or think about what lessons am I supposed to learn, because every time I think about this person, I get angry. So I guess my soul is just not evolved. So I would have to ask the question, do you think our soul came here to learn? How many of you think, you can raise your hand on this one, how many of you think your soul came here to learn something? Okay, several of you. That's what I was taught to think when I 
first got into Unity. That was a given, that I made the choice to come here because my soul was not, was in the process of evolving and there would be things I would need to learn here. But as I think about this, how could you learn something from a plane that is less than the one you came from? It vibrates at a rate much less. And that's one thing near-death people say. They step out of their body for a few moments and they realize that almost 100% of their faculties are numb while they're in the body. That is, they're not aware, nearly as aware as they are when they are out of their body. So the body has the effect of actually shutting down our faculties according to these people. And they say also, and this is a very common uh, response from so many of them, that being out of the body is more real than being in it that I, for the first time, experienced reality. And not only that, I was home. So you think about that. We step into a body, and we do it for some reason. And I think we do it for each for our own reason. And all of our main faculties are suddenly shut down because we step into this slower thing that we call a body. And I'm not saying this in a way to put the body down, but I'm just contrasting the difference. What would a soul who has this high level of ability to experience life, love, power, and intelligence, what would it have to learn by stepping into something less, dumbing itself down, blinding itself so it makes mistakes and so it begins to experience things like anger toward other people and things it never knew at the strict soul level. What could we possibly learn from people who are operating at levels that are even totally shut off from the spiritual dimension? And you say, well, maybe I need to learn patience. And that person's here to teach me patience. Well, if you could step out of your body for 10 minutes, you'd realize you have infinite patience. That's a natural quality. Because there's nothing to wait for. Everything is complete. On the spiritual level, we are complete. There's nothing to wait for. No one can rob you of anything that you have. It's only as we step into the body that we begin to possess, we begin to say, this is mine, that's mine, you violated my space, you physically violated me, you did something to me that robbed me of something of value. But if you don't have a body, there's nothing to be robbed of. You don't have anything. So you don't need to learn patience, you already have it. You already have everything you need at the soul level. So I used to believe that we came here to learn, and I don't believe that anymore. Why would we come then? We came because we wanted the experience. We've got a couple of scuba divers here, right? You know what it is. When you put your scuba clothes on, your outfit, and walk around on the dock or whatever, wherever on the beach, what's that like? Awkward? You don't like it, but you jump in the water and what happens? If you didn't have that stuff, you wouldn't last very long, right? So you put on the equipment to go down into an environment that allows you to experience that environment with relative peace of mind. So if you are, you show up on this planet without a body and say you want to give a talk and I step aside and you, the soul, steps up to the microphone and starts talking. What would all of us say? There's nothing going on. We can't hear. You don't have the right equipment. You can shout all you want and that's what people say when maybe they're in a car wreck 
and they're momentarily out of their body and all the people are standing around and they're trying to explain to all the people that I'm fine, what's wrong, you know, what's the problem here? I'm just fine, but nobody can hear them because they don't have the equipment to communicate. So I think we probably made the choice to come here much the same reason you would choose to dive into an alien environment, alien to the human body, so you can experience it. There's something here we wanted to do. And yet I think along the way we can get hung up in that human level, that body-based stuff, the relationships, the family relations, all the things that uh, we can get hung up in and we can carry problems for a lifetime because of that. And maybe even forget why we would have come here. I don't remember making any choice as to coming here because I wanted to. That just makes sense to me. But if I can say to all of the experiences that have happened to me, I'm not bound to you. You don't need to interfere with my reason for coming here. Maybe I can remember. Or maybe I can just say, I'm not going to remember. I'll just start over and enjoy this experience instead of carrying the baggage with me all this life. So did you attract on the, thinking back into the airplane, did you attract the obnoxious passenger because they had something to teach your soul? Do we, do we believe that? Or did you encounter them simply because you made a decision to fly? I've talked to uh, fellow ministers about problems that we encounter in churches. And one I remember uh, was talking to saying, why do you think we attract these things to us? And the answer came to me just as clear as day. I said, because we got ordained. We stepped into an environment that is dynamic. We have all kinds of people, all kinds of personalities, some with uh, highly resolved issues and some with unresolved issues. <laughs> We step into, and this is life in general, we stepped into the whole gamut of the human experience. So why do you have problems as a minister? It's because you were ordained, you stepped into an environment. Why would you have problems diving, you know, when uh, some, something comes up, happens to your tank or your mask leaks or whatever? You wouldn't have that problem unless you chose to dive, unless you chose to be there. So if your mask cracked or something like that, I don't know what kind of problems you might have, but if you had a problem, you wouldn't sit down there and say, why, what did I do to bring this on? <laughs> you would say, I'm in an environment that I better get out of before, so I can correct this thing. So it depends on what kind of spin we put on these things, you know, and, and our spiritual philosophy makes a big difference. Because from one point of view, you're a victim. Like, what did I do? And what are you a victim of? You're a victim of your own consciousness. What did I do to draw this person to me? You're sitting on the plane. What did I do? You know, I thought I resolved this. I made peace with the last obnoxious person that I met on the airplane. So why am I experiencing another one? Maybe I just didn't go far enough. But what we're saying is it's my problem. I'm doing this. And that's why I don't like the idea of the evolving soul because the problem is always yours. And that's not necessarily true. Now, how you handle a thing is your decision. That is the important level of choice making. But to say, why did you bring this on? What did I do to bring this on? You showed up. You showed up on this planet. So you can get so involved in asking that question that you forget that you probably came here to have fun. You came here to enjoy this, to see what it was like, to experience the people, places, and things that you've encountered. Didn't step here to take on a whole bunch of baggage that's gonna weight you down. Because that's the next question we would have to ask ourselves. If I came here to learn, why do I feel so heavy? 
why am I carrying so much stuff? If I came here to learn, <clears throat> I guess I'm going to have to come back. That's the logic. There's no way out of this trap if we hold that thought that I did something to bring this on. So I drew that obnoxious passenger because I made the decision to fly. That's a whole different thing than taking it to the personal level as to why did I draw this person to me. Will you allow this person to ruin your entire trip or will you let them go the moment you step off the plane? And that's kind of interesting. I was thinking about that question because that woman that was talking, that's the only thing I remember about that trip. <laughs> I don't remember where I was going. I don't remember anything else about it. I remember that woman. And I remember going deaf. So is that good? <laughs> you know, that I didn't take that trip to have that experience. I took the trip to get somewhere else to have, you know, whatever experience was over there. But that's what it can do to us. You know, we can get so hung up on that personality that we forget the trip. We forget why we're taking the trip. And it's not, uh, you know, I'm not up here giving a sermon. I'm giving you, I'm being very honest about how easy it is to be human and how challenging it is to be aware of your spiritual purpose and the purpose here on earth, why we're here. I like to think we're making this earthly trip simply because we wanted to. Let's just kind of strip away all the baggage, all the family thing, all the friends, all the experiences we've had, and just say, I came because I wanted to. I didn't know I was going to have all these experiences. I compare that to writing a book. You know, I want to write a book, so I sit down to write it, do you just sit down and write it and two days later it's done? There are so many problems you encounter when you're writing a book that it's sort of like having children. If I knew what was involved, would I do it again? <laughs> I don't know. That's why we forget. You know, God makes us forget so we'll have children next time we come around. So if we get caught up in the drama and influence of our fellow passengers, it's easy to forget why we set out on the journey. You surely had the experience of getting lost or confused in an airport. You ever done that? What has that to do with your purpose for flying? I went to, a, to the bathroom one time while I was waiting for a plane, waiting in the gate, and while I was there, the gate changed and I wasn't listening. <laughs> so I walk out to my gate and this plane's rolling out, and that was my plane. And like eight hours later, I got another flight, layover in the airport for eight hours. You ever had to do that? Talk about reincarnation. I mean, that's like, the, that's between lives there. That's a long time between lives. Stuff happens. Your choice to fly will put you in airports and seat you next to people with whom the only thing you share in common is the fact that you're on the same plane. Okay, can you look at family members that way? Can you look at people in your life that way? That we're fellow passengers. That we don't have to get bogged down in some of the relationships that we, that we do. And if we are bogged down into a relationship, we don't know how to resolve. If we start with this idea that I don't have to resolve the thing I think I have to resolve, I just simply have to remember that we're fellow passengers that I don't owe this relationship anything. So if we don't believe our parents gave birth to our souls, what about our siblings? Where do they fit in? See, it's all, it all raises a whole different way of thinking about it when we look at it that way. And again, I'm not going to throw out any answers. I'm working through stuff, and I'm hoping there are some tools here that help you kind of look, look at things if you're stuck in some place. So is our earthly journey really that much different? The people we travel, we're traveling together right now. You know, we're involved in this church as uh, fellow passengers in, in this experience. And we're all having, we're all here for our own reasons. And we don't have to 
to, to be burdened in any way by other people's experiences or reasons. And it makes the flight a lot better. And I know that when somebody's sitting right next to you and you're kind of in your face, that that's kind of a different thing. Google that. Google problem airline passengers and you're gonna die laughing because you've probably been in every one of the situations that the photographs they have. There's one scene, there's about 10 people, they're all biting each other's legs and they're pulling each other's hair and it's just, it's really funny to, I almost put that one up, but I thought, nah. These people will be laughing so hard that I won't be able to talk. Rather than spend another moment wondering what we failed to learn from a challenging relationship, let's turn our attention back to the possibilities that drew us to this earthly experience. When we boarded the plane that brought us here, we did it for a reason. We had something in mind. Okay, we're kind of cleaning the slate. We're stepping back. Are we pursuing this higher interest now? Or are we dragging ourselves down trying to reconcile unresolved issues with another passenger? We're off the plane with feet planted firmly in our desired destination. Let us choose to make the most of it. I remember stepping off the plane that time and I saw the woman later on in <laughs> the airport walking off. I just said, thank you, God. You know, just <laughs> She's got to be happier than when she was talking to me, thinking I was listening. Okay, <clears throat> so I hope this kind of helps spark something if you're dealing with any relationship issues, any family issues or whatever, uh, to move on to another level. All right, thanks for coming out. And we're going to beat this thing, right? We're going to keep doing this. All right, see you next week. You've been watching a talk presented by Reverend Doug Botorf at Independent Unity here in beautiful Grand Junction, Colorado. We would like to thank everyone who joined us here today, as well as those of you who joined us online. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please like and subscribe to our channel, and be sure to share it with those you think who might benefit from this message. If this brought value to your life, please consider donating to us on PayPal. Thanks again for watching.